What you just witnessed was a reenactment of what hundreds of thousands of young black and brown men and boys are subject to every year. Stop and frisk. The vast majority of them innocent of any crime. It's also referred to as stop, question, and frisk, and Terry stops, depending on the state you live in. Now, to the people subject to this type of harassment in the streets, it's terror, panic. And the person conducting this stop and frisk, despite the uniform, is often seen as a terrorist in these neighborhoods. Last year, I and a number of other people were arrested protesting this form of policing. We stood trial, and for about a year and a half, they offered us deals that we denied to make the case go away in order to stand trial. As I sat in that courtroom, quite frankly, questioning the choices I've made in life, <laughs> I had a lot of time to think. I started to wonder how we got here how this whole thing started, and that I wanted to know more about it, about the history of stop and frisk. And I found very shortly that it was more of a history of calm stats, comparable statistics. The story begins with this man, Jack Maple, and yes, he dressed like that. <laughs> Bowler hat, bow tie, air inspector shoes. He was a brilliant man who worked for the Transit Authority. He was the first person to take crime numbers and put them in a certain spreadsheet so people could extrapolate certain information from it. And you would track all types of details that they didn't really track them before. Like, the rare crimes happened, what time of day, the perpetrator, the victims, and so on. Prior to that, it was very difficult for police officers to put the attention and the forces where they need them to be in a timely fashion. Now, at the Transit Authority, Jack Maple worked for a man named William Bratton. You may recognize him. He was the chief there. This is when there was a separation between the Transit Authority and the NYPD. At around this time, New York City elected its first African-American mayor, David Dinkins. Now, it was the late 80s, early 90s, and crime was high in New York City. You had the crack epidemic, you had racial unrest, unemployment. David Dinkins was blamed for all of these social ills. The tabloids beat him up on the regular, despite the fact that, on average, the murder rate declined during his administration but it didn't help. In his last year in office, Dinkins and his police commissioner, Raymond Kelly, were able to secure funds from the Clinton administration to put to the Safe Streets, Safe City program. Just put tens of thousands of new cops on the streets in crime-ridden neighborhoods. But like I said before, it didn't help. He would lose his bid for re-election to Rudolph Giuliani. Giuliani, now in control of the city, took control of the federal money, and started to go out of his way to erase any evidence that David Dinkins had anything to do with crime going down in New York City. Brought in his own police commissioner, William Bratton, and his whiz kid, Jack Maple, and started to implement this form of taking care of crime using statistics. Now, there are four elements to CompStat. Identifying hotspots, attacking the hotspots with extra police, relentless follow-up to make sure those issues were taken care of, and monthly meetings about the crime numbers. It's often referred to as CompStat meetings. You may have seen that in The Wire. Anybody watch The Wire here? <laughs> These meetings were intense. You'd have the brass of the police department where they'd, br they'd bring in the police commanders, the rural chiefs, and just viciously criticize them over the numbers. Careers died in those meetings.
Gentlemen, the word from on high is that felony rates district by district will decline by 5% before the end of the year. We are dealing in certainties. You will reduce the UCR felonies by 5% or more, or... And I've always wanted to say this. Let no man come back alive. In addition, we will hold this year's murders to 275 or less. Christ. Feeling a little phased, Colonel Forster? A little dyspeptic? This who? No, sir. I'm good to go. Here's a fun fact for you people. If Baltimore had New York's population, we'd be clocking 4,000 murders a year at this rate. There is no excuse I will accept. I don't care how you do it. Just fucking do it. Uh, Deputy, as uh, familiar as we all are with the urban crime environment, uh, I think we all understand there are certain uh, uh, processes by which you can uh, reduce the number of overall felonies. You can uh, reclassify a nag assault or you can unfound a robbery, but uh, how do you make a body disappear? There isn't one of you in this room who isn't here by appointment. If you want to continue wearing those oak clusters, you will shut up and step up. Any of you who can't bring in the numbers we need will be replaced by someone who can. That is all. Now, as you can see, what began as a crime fighting tool quickly turned into a method of keeping your job and the means to gaining higher positions. This is the case today. Now, it might help a little to explain the hierarchy of the New York City Police Department. On top, you have the police commissioner. Below that, you have the borough commanders. Below that, you have the precinct commanders. And below that, you have the lieutenants and the sergeants. And below that, the patrolmen, the cops. And they're the ones who daily interact with the citizens. Now, it didn't really matter what was happening on the streets, whose rights were violated, how the citizens felt. All that mattered were the numbers. Around this time, the Giuliani administration, there was a paper published in 1982 called The Broken Windows Theory. It gained resurgence. It was the fuel for the second element of the giuliani Bratton administration, which was quality of life campaign, which basically says if people were allowed to pee in public, drink, Open, out of open containers or panhandle, a, n a number of more serious crimes would ensue in those areas. But if you arrest those peoples for those petty crimes, the community would feel safe and that the police were on top of crime in that area, regardless if that was true or not. Again, it was all about the numbers. Crime went down, at least the numbers said crime went down dramatically. This made powerful men's careers. It did so for William Bratton, it did so for Rudolf Giuliani and a host of other men. So much so that Time Magazine asked Giuliani and Bratton to be on the cover. Now, as the story goes, something came up and Giuliani couldn't make the photo shoot that day, but William Bratton did. There he is in a very dramatic trench coat, <laughs> looking like New York City's own dark night. This cover almost single-handedly launched William Bratton into another stratosphere as far as his national fame, international fame. And this cover almost single-handedly ended his career in New York City. Yes, I chose the funniest picture I could find. <laughs> Giuliani was so incensed that his police commissioner's profile was eclipsing his own, he pushed Branton out. But I wouldn't fall, uh, feel too bad for Branton because he landed on all fours, taking Comstat to the world brought to the UK, Australia, and throughout the United States. In fact, his top aides proliferated CompStat and the numbers crunching throughout the United States, going to states such as California, Florida, Connecticut, Chicago. CompStat would then, as it is now, become a policing tool, a very popular policing tool throughout the nation. In fact, it would win an award from the Harvard School of Government. Again, despite its very real effects in the neighborhoods. The numbers, it's all about the numbers. Because the numbers from the early to mid-90s and to the 2000s went down but then started to pl plateau, Giuliani felt emboldened enough to approach the city council and demand an historic third term. They said no. They were tired of Giuliani. So he finished out his term, and billionaire Michael Bloomberg became mayor, bringing in his own police commissioner, may look familiar, Raymond Kelly. 
And for the first time in the city of New York, you had someone serve twice as police commissioner. Raymond Kelly is a staunch supporter of Comstat, as is Michael Bloomberg. Now, why does this matter? Well, as I sat in that courtroom on trial, listening to police officers over and over testify against us, I thought about the power structure and how these numbers made the careers of many, many powerful men. And I thought about how I've heard story after story in the neighborhood I live in in Bed-Stuy of people having their property smashed by police officers trying to make the numbers, by people who had their wrists broken or their face smashed by police officers trying to make their numbers. This interaction and how the tension between the community and the police was building behind these numbers. I thought about the crimes in Washington Heights, the serial rapes that were, down, that were then downgraded to trespassing and simple assault so serious crimes wouldn't be reported on the books. I thought about all these things. And I, I wondered to myself, how is this ever going to change? We're out here in the streets, we're on trial, but how is this ever going to change? And then it hit me then that this was how it's going to change. When people decide that it is no longer socially acceptable to treat people in such a manner. When people decide to get together and say enough is enough. And this was the case throughout history. The women's suffrage movement, when people decided it was no longer socially acceptable to afford women less rights than you afforded men. When people decided it was no longer socially acceptable that our disabled brothers and sisters couldn't have the access that our able brothers and sisters could. When it was no longer socially acceptable to treat blacks different than you treated whites. And when it was no longer socially acceptable that not everyone could love and marry who they wanted. That is when change happens. That's how change is happening now. And I sat there and I was thinking about the numbers, the numbers, it's always about the numbers. And I realized that in the end, we're gonna win this fight because we, the people, we have the numbers. Thank you.